When human beings began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. The word Nephilim has been a hot topic for pretty much ever. What exactly does it mean? Fallen angels? Half man, half supernatural people like Hercules or Gilgamesh? Giants? All of the above? And to add to that mystery, this all happens before the flood of Noah. There are scant details about the world before the flood, other than it was a terrible, evil place, so bad that God regretted he ever made man. In a previous episode called The Book of Enoch, I read through the opening parts of First Enoch, which claims to be an account about the life of Enoch in that crazy world before the flood. Enoch, of course, is in the actual Bible in Genesis, described as a righteous man who walked with God and is one of the only people to be taken to heaven without dying. The book of Enoch, though, is in a category of books called Apocrypha, books that are of unknown or doubtful origin or authorship. Check out my Book of Enoch podcast for more on that. But here's a quick recap of the story in Enoch that'll be relevant to this episode. People on earth were multiplying, and the sons of God were enamored by the beauty of the daughters of men, so much so that they came down from the heavens and took them as wives and had children of their own. The offspring of this unholy union was giants. Then Shemyaza, the leader of the fallen angels, fearful of the repercussions of their actions, proposed that they all be bound together by an oath so that if one of them is punished, they will all be punished. They proceed to teach people sorcery and other evil things, while their offspring, the giants, consumed all the produce of mankind. Eventually, that wasn't even enough, and the giants turned against man and started devouring them as well. The good angels saw all of this unfolding and asked God why he hadn't intervened. God instructs the good angels to inform the bad angels that their sin has been acknowledged and that they will all be punished. None of their offspring will achieve eternal life. Ultimately, this moves into the flood of Noah, and the world is effectively started over from scratch. There is, of course, more to the story in Enoch, and there are two other books of Enoch after that. For this episode, I wanted to highlight another book from the Apocrypha that goes hand in hand with Enoch, the Book of Giants. The Book of Giants was among the works found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and as such, is dated to around the 2nd century BC. It is part of the antediluvian, or pre-flood, narrative alongside the Book of Enoch. As I mentioned before, it is an apocryphal book. It doesn't have a clear origin or a particularly strong tradition behind it, nor is it reliably sourced to or claimed by any specific author. Only fragments of this text survive, so there are quite a few missing words and sentences that can make it hard to read, but there's enough there to get a general idea of what is going on when you compare it with the events of the Book of Enoch. The Book of Giants more or less expands on what is happening in 1st Enoch, from the perspective of the giants. In particular, Oya and Haya, the sons of the fallen angel Semyaza, and also Gilgamesh, and yes, quite likely the same Gilgamesh from the Epic of Gilgamesh, though perhaps on a different timeline. What follows will be a paraphrased version of a couple of takes on the incomplete Book of Giants. I'll link to sources in the accompanying blog post on loreandlegends.net. So here is the Book of Giants. The sons of God consumed everything that the earth produced, the fish, the birds, all the fruit and all the grain. They even committed sins against the beasts and the reptiles. They performed every harsh deed with harsh utterance upon the male and female creation, and upon and among humanity itself. Two hundred angels left heaven for earth. The two hundred angels seized two hundred donkeys, two hundred asses, two hundred sheep and rams of the flock, two hundred goats, two hundred beasts of the field from every animal and from every bird, for experiments and breeding with humans. The fallen ones defiled all of creation, and begat giants and monstrous creatures. They corrupted the entire earth, 
defiling it by shedding blood at the hands of the giants. But this did not satisfy them, and they sought to devour and destroy much more. They were abominations who lacked true knowledge, and as the earth grew more corrupt, the giants grew more powerful. They considered persuading more angels to come to earth, otherwise their rule might perish and die. They caused great corruption on the earth, and believed that perpetuating that corruption was the only way to avoid destruction themselves. One day, the giant Mawe had a vision that men drenched a tablet in water so that it was covered. It was then lifted out, and all the inscriptions but three had vanished. He went to the other giants to discuss the dream. This vision is cause for cursing and sorrow, they said to him, and Mawe replied, I am the one who will be blamed for the deeds of those cast down out of heaven, and I shall have to go hear the spirits of the slain, complaining about their killers, and crying out that we should all die together. When I am sleeping and dreaming, bread and dwelling will be denied to me. So troubled with this vision, the monsters entered into the gathering of the giants. The giant Oya, son of Shimyaza, said to Mawe, Who showed you all this vision, my brother? Barakel, my father, was with me and experienced the same vision. But before Mawe had finished telling what he'd seen in his dream, Oya said to him, Now I have heard wonders. If a barren woman is giving birth, now that would be a wonder. Then Oya said to his brother Haya, Are we to be destroyed upon this earth? When they had finished discussing the dreams, both Oya and Haya wept before the assembly of giants and monsters. Use your strength, the group said. Then Oya said to Haya, This vision is for Azazel, for he showed the most corruption to humanity. The good angels will surely not let us be neglected. We are not to be cast down. We have strength and can fight for ourselves if need be. The giants all realize, though, that fighting the might of heaven is futile. Then Gilgamesh spoke. I am a giant, and by my mighty strength of my own arm and my own great strength, I can vanquish any one mortal. I have made war against them, but I am not able to stand against my opponents who reside in heaven and dwell in the holy places. They are stronger than I. The day of the wild beasts has come, and the wild man they call me. Then Oya said to him, I have been forced to have a dream. Sleep came to my eyes to let me see a vision, and now I too know that we cannot win. Gilgamesh, I saw a tree uprooted, except for three of its roots. While I was watching, there came the good angels. They moved all of the roots into a garden, but not the three. The vision concerns the death of our souls, and those of Gilgamesh and all his companions, said Oya. However, Gilgamesh said to me that it only concerned the fallen angels, and the giants were glad at his words. Then Oya left the assembly. Thereupon two more of them had visions, and sleep escaped from them. When it had passed, they went and told the monsters what they had seen, that in their dreams they observed a garden where gardeners were watering two hundred trees, and large shoots came out of their roots. Then the garden caught fire, and was destroyed. Then they went to the giants to tell them of their dreams. Enoch, the noted scribe, he will interpret the dream for us. Then Oya declared to the giants, I too had a dream. The ruler of heaven came down to earth and made an end of us, and such was the ending of my dream. All the giants and monsters grew afraid and called Mawe. He came to meet the giants, who pleaded with him and sent him to Enoch. They said to him, Go to Enoch, so that he may speak to you, and then return, saying that you have heard his voice. Oya said to Mawe, Enoch will listen and interpret the dreams and tell us how long we giants have to live. Mawe mounted up in the air, as if upon strong winds, using his hands like eagle's wings. He left behind the inhabited world and passed over the desolation of the great desert. Enoch saw him and hailed him. He told Enoch why he had come the contents of their dreams, and the fears of the giants and the monsters. Enoch listened, and then he presented Mawe with a tablet which was full of foreboding about the coming judgment, but which offered some hope for the future through repentance. Enoch gave Mawe a copy of another tablet that bore Enoch's own handwriting. The writing on the tablet said, In the name of God the Great and Holy One, this message is sent to Shimyaza and his companions. Let it be known to the giants and monsters that you will not escape from all the things that you have done, 
your wives, their sons, and the wives of their sons will not escape either, and that by your licentiousness on the earth, judgment is upon you. The land is crying out to heaven about you and the deeds of your children and the harm you have done to it. Until Raphael arrives, behold, destruction is coming, a great flood which will destroy all living things, whatever is in the deserts and the seas. The meaning of the matters you tell to me is that judgment is upon you for all of your evil. But if you now loosen the bonds of evil, repent, and pray for forgiveness, you may yet be saved. And that's really all we have from the Book of Giants, as found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'll come back to that after a quick break. So you can see how closely the Book of Giants mirrors parts of First Enoch, but from a different perspective. There are several things that stand out to me, but from an emotion standpoint, you can really grasp the sense of fear and regret the giants and the monsters feel. They keep trying to tell themselves that it's really all the fault of the fallen angels, despite their own involvement. They're like the person who is complicit in a crime getting caught and then throwing the other guy under the bus. The dreams they have get progressively more and more ominous until finally they get one where God himself comes down and executes judgment. And you'll notice that after that dream, they have a hard time saying that this is really just about the fallen angels. But we got to back up a little bit too. This is called the Book of Giants, but monsters come up several times. It's never really explained in detail, but the general consensus here is that these are the crossbreeds, the half-bird people, half-god type beings. In my mind, I kind of picture something like the Egyptian gods, Anubis, the jackal-headed man, Horus with the falcon head, and even some of the Sumerian or Babylonian Anunnaki, and on and on with just about any kind of animal. A few other names that pop up that are also featured prominently in First Enoch, Azazel, Shemyaza, and Barakel. These are three of the fallen sons of God that are in Enoch. Azazel is ultimately the one who takes the brunt of the blame. You can see here in the Book of Giants that even the giants attribute much of the chaos to Azazel without skipping a beat. Shemyaza is the one who thought up the idea of making a pact amongst the fallen angels to commit to earth and the consequences as a single group. Shemyaza is the one the second tablet from Enoch is intended for, and it says the same basic thing as it does in Enoch, that they're all about to go down hard. Barakel is mentioned as well. He is the father of Mawe. In First Enoch, Barakel is associated with observance of the stars and astronomy. There's also a brief mention of the giants scoffing at the idea of a barren woman giving birth, which sort of reminds me of the Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac story. And in this Enoch-centric pre-flood world, we also get the name Gilgamesh. I covered the Babylonian story of Gilgamesh in a couple of previous episodes. No doubt a lot of people take a very syncretistic view to parts of the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Book of Genesis, particularly the Flood of Utnapishtim and the Flood of Noah. I go into more details on those specific issues on loreandlegends.net in posts titled The World Before the Flood and Gilgamesh Addendum, Flood Myths, and another one called Syncretism, which I'll also put in the description for this episode. The Gilgamesh we get, albeit briefly, in the Book of Giants, is incredibly similar to the Gilgamesh from the Epic of Gilgamesh. He's a boaster in both cases, who loves to talk about his own strength and his dominance of men. But he also admits that he can't quite take on a quote-unquote god, the little g-gods in this case being the angels of heaven, and his part god lineage running through the fallen angels. He's also not a fan of being mortal in both stories, and he's willing to fight for immortality. Of course, the Epic of Gilgamesh is centered around his quest for immortality, wherein the Babylonian gods repeatedly tell him no. It's easy to see why so many people take books like this and point towards a common past. You have creation, the fall of man, the corruption of the world, and the world being ruled by monstrous deities that are only part human, as well as the giants. That's a pretty common theme in a lot of mythologies. A pantheon of lesser gods, some more good or bad than others, but all of them seeming to operate to their own ends. Actual giants, in the literal sense, appear across the board as well, as do the shape-shifting little g-gods themselves. The Egyptian deities were known to be transformers, 
Isis into a bird, Set into a beast. Zeus is famous for transformations into sexual exploits in Greek mythology, and there's giants and titans there too. In the Greek legend, Zeus sends a flood to wipe out bad humans. The Noah figure in that story is Deucalion. There are scraps about an Egyptian flood narrative as well, and I've also told a handful of Native American flood myths in my past episodes, including a really recent one called Navajo Creation Lore, Thunderbirds, and my first episode, Coyote. Norse mythology, Hindu mythology, it goes on and on. The differences here are all in timeline, characters, and the nature of big G god versus little g gods. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the flood occurred well before Gilgamesh's time, and it was already a myth. He learned about the flood of Utnapishtim. The Noah-ish character in that legend he had to seek out on a long and dangerous journey. Then, unable to achieve immortality, Gilgamesh went on to get old and die naturally, as opposed to being wiped out by a supernatural calamity. In virtually all other stories, except for a couple of Native American stories, the little g-gods that are involved are more similar to the good angels and the bad angels of the Book of Enoch and the Book of Giants than to big g-god. So if you do some mental gymnastics, you could squeeze this all into a rough timeline and then try to say that the little g-gods were the fallen angels on different parts of the world who created characters like Hercules and Gilgamesh in turn before all of them being wiped out in a flood, but in the process, you've basically destroyed all of the original characters, their meaning, and their historical context. It's all an interesting thought, but it probably shouldn't be more than that. A relevant quote I like from a scholar and theologian named Ben Witherington III is, Text without context is just pretext for whatever you want it to mean. I'll go back to the word syncretism. I wrote about it on loreandlegends.net, but basically, it's the idea that we see things that appear vaguely similar and then conclude that they must in fact be the same thing, even without looking at any of the context behind the individual components themselves. And again, Enoch and Giants are both works in Apocrypha. They aren't canonical religious beliefs, especially in the case of the Book of Giants. The works in the Apocrypha are all interesting in their own way, but I think a lot of times people stumble on these books and they feel like they're the first one to ever see them, or that they were nefariously hidden for a long time. And usually that's not the case. In fact, almost never that's the case. A lot of really bright minds have looked at this stuff, and they've all reached the same conclusion over the centuries, that these books can't be verified, they can't be trusted, and many of them are forgeries, claiming to be written by someone that they're not. But certainly that hasn't stopped discussion and fascination with these books. So what do you think about the Book of Giants and the Book of Enoch? Is there something there? Or is this just a really inventive prequel of sorts to the Book of Genesis that already existed? Picking up on the same few verses that have fascinated people forever and creating a story where there might not be one. Go check out loreandlegends.net for more content related to this episode. There will be a blog post titled The Book of Giants that will have links to some show notes and some other content you might find interesting. You can also follow Lore and Legends' Facebook page and follow me on Minds.com, where my handle is at Obi Wade. You can now support Lore and Legends on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month and get regular bonus content. There's already a full podcast episode available on Patreon that will only be available to supporters. So go check out patreon.com slash lore and legends and become a supporter for as little as a dollar. There's also going to be some bonus content coming out with this episode. So by the time you hear this, there's going to be two pieces of bonus content on Patreon. You can also chip in at paypal.me slash lore and legends. Or if you join minds.com, you can give me a token. If you choose to become a supporting listener at any of these places, it'll get you access to the private Facebook group, where I will also post the bonus content. Links to all this stuff will be in the episode description. And if you like the show, be sure to subscribe and share it with your friends. That's all I had for this episode. See you next time. The music in this episode, in order of occurrence. The Complex. Long Note 3. Shadowlands Codex. Lost Time. Jalandar. All of them are by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0.
visit incompetech.com and creativecommons.org slash licenses slash by slash 4.0 for more information.